Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 27th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss what we will be looking for in the governor's budget announcements coming later this week. Second, we follow up on an article in the Anchorage Daily News by explaining what we will be on the alert for in the coming Willow decision. And third, we continue our review of the issues this coming election cycle. This week, we talk about infrastructure. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad. Well, let's uh, let's do this whole weekly top three thing. The number one thing, of course, is we've been waiting for it for weeks, and that is the governor's budget. I kept hearing, oh, it's going to be any day, any day. I finally got word last week that... Uh, Um, I think it was on Friday, Thursday or Friday, that the governor was going to make the announcement today, today, that uh, of on his budget. And you've given this a little thought. What are you uh, what are you thinking here for uh, for the governor's budget announcement supposedly today? Well, I'm going to be looking for 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 places the governor cuts, hopefully cuts, because we have a huge budget uh, that was approved by the legislature, places the governor cuts and and then look at what that means for uh, the five years forward and the in the ten years forward. It's not to me. It's not so much about what's going to be going on next year. It's what he's cutting, what he's doing to shape uh, future spending. Uh, this budget uh, elevated uh, spending levels across the board. We had been at a budget level of about oh four point seven billion dollars for several years, give or take. Uh, on both sides of that. Uh, we even were, were at that level for FY22 um, uh, before we came into this budget. But with oil prices up and oil revenues up, this legislature went berserk. Uh, with the supplementals, they raised uh, FY22 from about $4.6 billion where it had been to uh, $5.6 billion, raised spending by about a $1 billion. Uh, FY23, uh, the year that uh, that we're about to start uh, on July one uh, is at five point eight six billion dollars. That is that's exclusive of uh, of the PFD, which we count uh, count separately in the in the traditional manner, the pre uh, twenty seventeen manner. So spending is way up a billion dollars for FY twenty two, counting the supplementals, uh, another two hundred million dollars on top of that uh, for for FY twenty three, and we're going to be looking at what that means long term uh, 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 operating the operating budget uh, the agency budget uh, is up from 3.92 billion dollars in FY21 to 4.27 billion dollars up 300 million dollars the the statewide budget uh, statewide operating budget is up from 400 million dollars to 780 million dollars between FY21 and FY23. Capital okay. budgets up. Wait a second. Let, let's go back to that just for just a hot second. That's a doubling of what just had from four hundred million to seven hundred and eighty million. That's just this shy this side of a doubling of that budget. It is, and 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 it's all in FY twenty three. I mean, it's a right FY twenty two was four hundred million dollars, and, and FY twenty three is seven hundred eighty million dollars. The capital budget is up from 
you can do the multiple on this. The capital budget is up from $240 million uh, in FY21 to $820 million uh, in FY23. So the all, all categories, the agency budget, statewide uh, uh, operating budget, and the capital budget all have exploded in the FY23 budget. Now, some of that is one-time spending. So for example, in the in the statewide budget, what they did was prepay was pay, was was come current on the oil and gas tax credits, and then prepay uh, the estimated uh, remaining oil and gas tax credits uh, over the over the remaining few years. Um, so you've got you've got some one-time money in all of these budgets, but you've got some increased spending on on continuing items in these budgets as well. Frankly, what we hope the governor does. I doubt he does it, but frankly, what I hope the governor does is say, here's what I'm doing for FY23, and here's my 10-year plan going forward uh, from FY23. Here's here's how I get spending. Here's the one-time money. Here's why it doesn't disrupt our plans to continue to keep uh, spending under control uh, going forward. If the governor doesn't do a 10-year plan, then I'm going to step in and do a 10-year plan and and figure out what's one-time money, what's continuing and what the 10 year plan is. My concern is that is that what we've done with FY23 is we've reset uh the table that we had the tape that we had it down to about 4.7 billion dollars in spending and now as a as a result of the increases that we that we're doing uh in uh, in the in the agency budget in the statewide budget and in the capital budget that we've reset the table to a significantly higher level than that and the new baseline going forward uh, is going to be significantly higher uh, going forward. If we've done that, that's it's a recipe for failure because as we've talked on the show time and time again, uh, oil prices, when you look at the futures market, oil prices are going back down. Uh, volumes aren't going to make up, increased volumes aren't going to make up for uh, for the decline in oil prices that we see in the futures market. And so revenues are going to are going to moderate in the years ahead. If we've reset the table to higher spending levels going forward, uh, then we've just created, you know, an even greater burden uh, for ourselves to deal with. So, to us, the important thing, the important thing in 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 the bud in the governor's announcement on the budget is not only what's he going to cut, but is he is he is he resetting the table, the expectations table from a higher level down to down to you know back to where we were uh, before we before we ran up the uh, ran up the the spending this year. One of the countervailing factors, frankly, is going to be his opponents, uh, uh, Bill Walker and Les Guerra, are going to be looking for opportunities to, you know, claim this governor's insensitive again to claim that any vetoes uh, are vetoes of necessary, essential, uh, 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 needed spending, uh, and so the governor is going to, you know, try and is going to be walking a tightrope between. Uh, between you know uh, trying to get spending back down and and not you know creating a 2019 situation where people sort of exploded uh, at his spending cuts. I well I think it's I think it's important that that the governor send a message that yes spending's up this year but it's on one time items it's on things that 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 we had an opportunity to do because of revenue but we're going back down. Uh, and we're and we're going to get back down to the levels that we were before. Well, I mean, let's. There's two things there. First and foremost, uh, you know, I think yes, I, I agree. I think it, it, it's we're going to need to look at what is he changing in the future. One of the things that we've really had a failure in leadership in this state from pretty much every governor is this lack of a long term. <clears throat> sure, we'll put this program in place now, but what is it going to cost us in ten years? You know, sure, I could do this now, but whatever, you know, that we've had this lack of long term vision. It's only it seems like it's always been election to election instead of where does this program or this spending thing take us in 10 or 15 or 20 years? And so, yes, you're right. We definitely I, I, I like the idea of looking at the cuts and looking at the budget and saying, what is he what is he going to do that's going to shape us 10 to 15 years down the road? But secondly, uh, you were just talking about Guerra and uh, Walker trying to take advantage and trying to, you know, spin this into, you know, again, the apocalyptic draconian, the sky is falling, all these cuts, everything's essential. I guess my question here, there is, how does that play out? I mean, Dunleavy really could 
you know, he could go and and play to his base. It may be too little too late in this election cycle, but he could go to his base and say, you wanted cuts, I'll give you cuts. Here's what it looks like, and here's why, with his vision, to articulate that, you know, we need to be looking 10 or 20 years down the road. Do you think he does that, or do you think he plays the safe route and just says, here's a little cut, please don't hurt me? I mean, you know, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think? Well, given given what the governor's done in the last few years since 2019, right. I, I don't I don't expect a, uh, a a playing to the base. I don't expect a going back to the 2019 uh, uh, Mike Dunleavy. I expect a a middle of the road. Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative uh, sort of. <laughs> the sort lip of. service? Are you saying lip service? I'm a fiscal conservative. Pay no attention to the red pen marks on this thing here right now. <laughs> Um, well, no, I'm a fiscal conservative. Pay no attention to the spending levels that I just signed is, exactly. is sort of the, is, is sort of the message. Um, I, I think he's going to, I think he's going to try to cut down the road. I mean, this, this is a poll driven governor, right? And the polls are going to tell him what he needs to be doing, or he's going to look at the polls to say what he needs to be doing to eke out a 51% uh, out of the, out of the rank choice voting at the end of the day. Uh, in November. And he's going to have to have, he's going to say, he's going to, his pollsters are going to tell him he's going to have to have uh, some second choice uh, votes from Walker. uh, And he's going to have to have some second choice votes that go to, go to Charlie on the, on the, on the first, uh, first ballot, uh, the first, the first pick. Um, And, and, and he's going to have to, you know, sort of have a a middle of the road uh, uh, position. So I, um, I don't expect, I, I, what I'm really concerned about is 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 he says he's cutting, but when you look at it, it's it's marginal things uh, that that uh, marginal things that really don't matter in the long term. Look good, can say that he's that can say that he's cutting, but he leaves in place this sort of pent up push, increased push that's uh, that's occurred in the in, in between the supplemental and the and the and the FY23 budget leaves that in place. And then when you look at a 10 year plan, uh, a 10 year forward that, uh, that we've got an increased base that we're dealing with. I mean, we've already got uh, a situation going forward where we're going to be, you know, costs are going to be pushing up. Spending is going to be pushing up because inflation is, is significantly higher than it has been in the past. So inflation is going to be pushing uh, some of those costs up. So it's, I, I'm, I'm concerned that what we have at the end of the day, after the governor's announcement, uh, uh, particularly if he doesn't show a ten-year plan, what we have at the end of the day uh, is, uh, is is some nibbling at the edges, but uh, but not a significant change in the in the increased forces that got unleashed during this last legislature. Uh, Jim says in the chat room, we still have one of the lowest state budgets in the union. Regardless of per capita, go with per square mile. And with all due respect, <laughs> with all due respect, Jim. <laughs> With, with with all due respect, wow, no, no, you've got to go on a per capita spending basis when you're comparing. You have to look at the amount of money spent on government per person to even have it make sense for comparatives. I mean, Alaska is one third the size of the U.S. If you did, yes, if you looked at it on a per square mile basis, you're right. We have the lowest budget ever. Uh, if you look at it on a per capita basis... No, that's not quite right. So I'm just, I, no, Jim, sorry, that doesn't work out. That's just not how you factor those kind of things. Uh, because, you know, yes, the 15 cents per square mile that they are paying, uh, spending on Alaska government, you're right, looks incredibly low. But it's just not the way, uh, it's just not the way you are. You know, uh, I got I got to give points for creativity for that. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody <laughs> try to do it on a per square mile basis. Yeah, no, no, per square mile basis. That's not uh, that's not how we do things here in the long run. Um, and when you say oil price is going down, I'm just going back and looking at some of the comments here. Uh, when you say oil price is going down, you're talking about in uh, not just the short term, like the next 24 months, but this is a this is a, a long term cycle of where things are going. Yes, Ukraine and Russia and the embargoes and everything else have pushed the prices up, but that will not lo- that will not not last in the long term. You can't count on it in the long term. That's what the futures markets are telling you, right? Right. The futures markets are saying two things. One, they're saying there's going to be demand destruction, and we're already seeing demand destruction. I mean, people aren't driving as much 
at uh, five dollar oil or five dollar gasoline than the, as they were at four dollar gasoline. If you look over in Europe, uh, factories are uh, are closing because of of high uh, energy prices. So futures market is one saying prices are going to go down because. Of demand destruction, people can't the, the the you can't support the demand levels at these prices over the long term. And second, uh, people are saying the futures market is saying there's going to be substitution to some degree, substitution of of additional oil supplies, but but more. Uh, this is pushing uh, the markets more towards substitution by uh, renewables, uh, more solar, more uh, uh, more wind, more other more alternative uh, energy uh, uh, systems. And so what we're seeing is is the futures market are factoring in not only uh, not only the Ukraine and 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 Russia and the various uh, outtakes of that or the various implications of that in the in the current, but they're looking over the long term. I do uh, we do uh, uh, a daily assessment of or look at the futures markets for what the futures markets are saying over the next five years on a daily basis. We look at it weekly on Fridays. Of what they're saying over the over the ten year time span of the current ten uh, year plan, um, and future and and futures prices five years out are already dipping below seventy dollars. They're they're in the sixty dollar range. Recently, they've they've moved into that range. So it's a I mean people who who put actual money uh, into the market as opposed to just speculating and and you know bloviating to some degree on what prices are going to be. People that that put actual money into the market. Uh, uh, in investing and 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 you know uh, in making decisions based upon what they think the, the where they think the futures market are going to be, they say the markets uh, the prices are going to be in decline uh, over the long term. We move on from number one to number two, which is the administration's decision on Willow, uh, the Biden administration, and what you really think that we should be looking for in that decision. Uh, give give us a start here. Well, there's a there's a great piece in uh, a, a, a great in the sense that I think it's very descriptive and, and captures the current environment well. In the ADN, that's a, essentially a reprint from a piece that was in the in the Washington Post uh, focused on uh, on on Willow. Willow has become um, it's sort of the new Anwar, right? Now that Anwar has effectively been shut down. The environmentalists, uh, to the extent they're focused on Alaska, are turning their attention to Willow, and and trying to shape the administration's response to uh, to uh, to the Willow uh, supplemental EIS. For those that for those that uh, want to catch up a little bit, remember that Willow got approved during the the EIS, the environmental impact statement got approved during the Trump administration, uh, but it was the fort, courts found it to be deficient. Uh, and the court in Alaska, district court in Alaska, found it to be deficient. Uh, Conoco and the BLM agreed to do a supplemental EIS. They've been working on the supplemental EIS. And given the drumbeat of environmental uh, uh, discussion that's been going on with Willow, it's likely that uh, that the the e, that the BLM is nearing uh, the end of uh, the supplemental EIS, about to publish it uh, and come forward. So. The the article that's in the ADN, the reprint from the from the Washington Post uh, uh, article, is a uh, sort of captures uh, a lot of what's going on with Willow. Uh, we're going to be looking for uh, one thing in particular uh, out of uh, out of what the the BLM does, and um, and if it's timely, we can discuss that when we come back from the break. We're in number two of the weekly top three. And, of course, uh, we were talking about the Biden administration's decision on the Willow Project. And what Brad says, we, uh, you know, what Brad says, we really need to be looking at uh, in this decision on Willow. Brad, let's uh, let's get down into the weeds here and tell us, uh, you know, what's going on. Well, to some degree, this is sort of like the governor's budget, right? I mean, so Willow has, has a, a lot of different aspects to it a lot of different proposals to it, a lot of different uh, uh, views of what it can become. And at one extreme, uh, uh, what Conoco has applied for is essentially to set up Willow to be what they what they refer to, what Conoco refers to as the new hub on the North Slope, a, a brand new hub that will, that, will, that will be the center point for a lot of exploration that goes on around it. Willow, the, the stuff they've applied for is the start, but their vision is that there's additional exploration that goes on 
uh, additionally around that hub, comes in through the, the Willow hub, feeds the Alpine hub, ultimately comes into TAPS and, and comes down uh, to Valdez. That's that's one view of it. it, it it's, a, it's a beginning of a brand new exploration area, development area, production area uh, built around, around this hub. Um, and then there's and then there's a, a another view. Uh, then there's the other extreme that Willow doesn't get approved by uh, the BLM, and BLM just shuts it shuts it down in the same way that effectively uh, they've shut down uh, Anwar. So it, it, it's sort of like the governor's budget in the sense that he can approve all the spending, or he can approve none of the spending. He can veto all of the spending. The expectation is there will be a middle ground uh, that the BLM will search for a middle ground approving a portion of Willow, but not the full vision that Conoco has has put into its application and that Conoco talks about um, in its presentations. And and what we're going to be looking for is is what middle ground the BLM sort of tries to establish. The BLM is going to approve Willow. Um, (laughs) Biden would completely undo Murkowski uh, up here, something he does not want to do. Right, right. BLM disapproved Willow. So, so BLM is going to approve Willow. But the question is, what kind of Willow, what, what extent of Willow are they, going to, are they going to approve? There's a passage in the middle of the Washington Post article that's, again, available uh, on the Anchorage Daily News website. It says, even its critics in Alaska acknowledge the chances of stopping Willow are slim. The project may get smaller. The five drill sites originally proposed could drop to four or three according to local officials and others briefed on the changes. But there is more public support for drilling in the Petroleum Reserve than there is in Anwar. Opponents hope, and this is the key, opponents hope that the Bureau might approve a version of the project that's too costly for ConocoPhillips to pursue. Willow is going to be expensive. And and in order to justify the, the investment it's going to take to develop Willow, Conoco is going to be looking at a lot of volume, a lot of production, a lot of development uh, that's going to go on about will go go on around Willow to justify the the initial uh, upfront cost. And what I think the the pushback that the environmental community is making is they would like to kill it first. They'd like to do a pebble to it first, just absolutely kill it. But if they can't do that, they want to narrow it down to the point that Conoco looks at the cost, the upfront cost, and says. We're not going to be able to make any money given the narrow scope uh, of the approval that we're getting out of BLM, and right. so, and so BLM gets 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 the benefit of saying, "Hey, we approved it," but then Conoco effectively <laughs> killing it by saying, "You only approved you you didn't approve enough to make it economic." Right. It's like saying, "Here, you can have it, but it's so unattractive and uneconomical that you'll never want to buy it," kind of thing. Yeah, exactly right. And so, and so, what we're going to be looking for, and what others are going to be looking for, is what kind of approval does does BLM give? What kind of conditions do they put on it? What kind of scope do they allow Conoco to pursue? I mean, now Conoco can say, Conoco can say, look, you know, we're getting a narrow scope the first time, but the Republicans are probably coming back in chart, back in control, and so we're gonna we're gonna think that we can step out in the next administration with additional approvals. There's a lot of shades of gray that are going to sit uh, inside inside this approval, but initially the uh, the focus is going to be on what kind of approval, what's the scope of the approval, what are the conditions that are put on the approval uh, uh, as this thing uh, as this thing goes forward. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Do we look forward? I mean, we have any kind of time frame on when this, uh, when when the the decision is supposed to come out? Is you know when BLM is supposed to say yes or no or everything? I think uh, I think originally uh, uh, people were looking toward uh, the end of the year, but given the pace of of comments going on, uh, the environmental community sent a letter to the Department of Interior a few days ago, a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, 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 asking for the department to slow down the willow approvals given the pace of activity around the discussion right now i think we may be looking at july august september uh for uh, for the eis uh, uh to to come out so a supplemental eis to come out so i think i think the pace is quickened up and you know again go back to murkowski i think the administration wants to get this thing out before the fall election to show that They've reacted positively to what Senator Murkowski has asked them to do 
to to help bolster Murkowski's prospects uh, in the election. And it's not going to do any good to do that in December. So uh, the soon the, the I think they're going to be looking at July, August, September now to uh, to get it out. They want to get it out to be able to give something that Murkowski can crow about prior to the election. And uh, and so this is another way to help protect one of their allies in Congress. Am I wrong? No, you're you're absolutely right. And 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 frankly, that that works to Alaska's benefit. Not only do we get it sooner, but they're they're going to want to do it. There's going to be a real balancing act going on in here, but they're going to want to do it in a way that's effective. Uh, they're going to want to do it in a way that Conoco doesn't immediately say, "Well, we it's not economic to do that." They they, they want to do it in a way that has Conoco saying, "Yes, we can go forward with this project." Um, so it's it's the the fact they're trying to be helpful to Murkowski, I think, is 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 helpful to Alaska uh, in the sense that it's likely going to get us a, a better approval than we would have otherwise. Frankly, if we had if we had Sullivan and Shabaka as as senators, I think the administration might just go go ahead and crater it. The fact that they're trying to keep Murkowski, the fact they're trying to 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 show that they're responsive to Murkowski is uh, is benefiting Alaska. All right, let's move on to number three, Brad, and that is a look at the candidates that are coming up in the next general election here, and you're looking in on your next campaign issue. You've already done a couple of these with us, but this is the third campaign issue. Uh, This week, we're talking about infrastructure, um, jobs, growth, capital budgets, et cetera. What do you got? Well, a lot of candidates, I think, are going to run this election cycle on infrastructure, that they support infrastructure. And that's a code word for jobs. Uh, they're going to say, you know, we're trying to increase jobs, uh, construction jobs uh, throughout the state, what the state can do to push for construction jobs. Uh, and we're trying to increase the infrastructure in the state so that it so that it makes commerce easier, makes business easier, makes business uh, less expensive uh, throughout the state. Um, and, and there's a theme as we look at these campaign issues. My reaction is, our reaction is, that's fine, but who's going to pay? Who's going to pay for this for this infrastructure that you want to that you want to fund? And some candidates are some candidates are saying uh, that uh, they're going to fund it through uh, uh, lower PFDs. That right, that, you know, they'll just take the money out of the PFD. And so essentially, what they're saying is middle and lower income Alaska families will be paying for the infrastructure, not the not the top twenty percent, but middle and lower income Alaska families will be doing this infrastructure on the back. Of, uh, of of middle and lower income Alaska families, so essentially, they're going to be arguing that we that we need to increase jobs, we need to increase you know construction contracts, construction profits. They won't say that, but that's what they're talking about, right? Uh, and and we need to increase all these things. But when it gets down to who pays, we don't want our donors to pay. We don't want our contributors to pay. We don't we want, want to push same, it on. The, yeah, we don't want the same people that are benefiting the contractors. We don't want them to pay. We want the lower and middle income families to pay. Yeah, exactly right. So the question that needs to be asked all these times when people talk about increased spending, either on K-12 or infrastructure, who pays? Who are you proposing pay for it? I don't really care about your increased spending plans. Who do you want to pay for it? That tells me more about you as a candidate than anything else. Well, and I think Jimmy just stole my, Jim, I'm sorry, not Jim, uh, not Jimmy, but Jim just stole my thunder in the chat room when he says construction jobs are temporary jobs. That's the whole thing about government creating jobs. They're almost always temporary, unless they are government jobs. They're almost always temporary or, or, uh, or fleeting or finite. The private sector is what creates jobs. Get out of the way of the, of the private sector and let them create that wealth. Let them create those jobs and stop pouring money into the economy and temporary spits and spurts and and um, and uh, you know uh, uh, facilitating this this business model of many businesses who are dependent on those government contracts rewarding them for that kind of behavior yeah I'm going to be very skeptical of candidates who say that uh, that they're that they're big on infrastructure that their plan is to go build a lot of infrastructure unless and, and nobody's going to do this but unless they step up and say and we're going to fund it equitably. All Alaska families are going to pay for it, as opposed to just pushing it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. One minute left, Brad. Final thoughts here before we let you go. Well, quickly, I think I, I think we're going to see a lot of these campaign issues through the through the course. We're going to talk about a lot of them. Uh, they're all going to be you know spending plans, and the question for every one of those plans is going to be who pays for it. Who are you proposing pay for it? And if it's PFD cuts or if it's you know, some amorphous, uh, well, we'll find the money someplace. 
uh, then frankly, I'm going to be very skeptical of, 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 of the candidates that are pushing it. You know, I mean, this is the thing. And, and, and I, I, I mean, Brian says by definition, construction jobs are temporary. And I understand that, but I think Brian also knows what I'm trying to get at here, which is everything that the government seems to be pushing are pretty much all temporary one or two time jobs. And of course, until the next time they push another construction job and then the next time, and it's all about creating that business model where these businesses have become uber dependent on that continued government expenditure. Therefore, they have a vested interest in following and keeping up and supporting those types of policies. And that's the biggest problem. I mean, that's the problem in this state, Brad, is that we've got an economy that has become dependent in many ways on that government spending. Oh, it is. It is. I mean, and, and yes, I infrastructure jobs are temporary, but it's but it's continuous temporary, right? I mean, you 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 do a bunch of construction contracts, and then you know, as they wind down, people start whining that we're going to have all these unemployed construction workers, and we need more construction contracts. And so, you know, Click Bishop and others go back in and say, "Oh, we need more infrastructure. There's always something we can do. Uh, there's always new buildings to be built. There's always new highways to be built. There's always new, you know." Uh, access roads uh, to be built. We need to continue to to do that over and over. So it's it's an ongoing wave of yes, temporary in any given time frame, but an ongoing way of wave of uh, of these temporary jobs. And yes, we have built a business model uh, that's that's based on that. Used to be, it was oil that funded it, and then as the oil as the oil revenues ran down in the early 20 teens, it became uh, uh, savings. And then as we ran through savings, now it's the it's the permanent fund dividend. Now it's getting real because we're taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. We're taxing middle and lower income Alaska families to, to pay for these to pay for these projects. It may be these projects are good things. Um, it, it may be that that we need infrastructure. But if they're good things, then we should have all Alaska families pay for it. We shouldn't be shoving the burden of paying for these things, these good things. We shouldn't be shoving the burden of paying for it to middle and lower uh, income Alaska families. If if we're really improving the lives of, of Alaskans right. by doing these things, all Alaskans ought to contribute toward the cost. Right. If we're really doing a good thing, we should not be ashamed to dive down into it and talk about the details of who pays for it. We shouldn't we shouldn't avoid the second that they start avoiding those kind of conversations is the second that red flags ought to be flittering around in your mind saying, wait a second, what's what's going on with that? Why won't you address that? Yeah, exactly right. Or if they say, if they say, well, you know, the permanent fund dividend is free money, free cash. We ought to just divert it to this. Well, <laughs> yeah, great. So you're going to take, it's not free cash. You're taking it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. You're taxing them to pay for it, to pay for things that benefit not only, admittedly, it will, it will benefit middle and lower, but it will benefit the top 20% also. Why aren't you proposing that they pay for it as well? Right. Exactly. And, the, and the answer is the answer is it's our donors. We don't want to do that. Right. Exactly. Well, and again, it furthers the dependency cycle in this state. I mean, we're, it's already bad enough. This state is already bad enough in the dependency cycle. We don't need anything that adds to that. And unfortunately, that seems to be the new status quo is that we'll just add to it, you know, and they don't talk about the effects of taking that money out of the private economy where it turns on its own. Now, people will argue, well, it eventually gets into the private economy anyway, because it's going to the contractors and yada, yada, yada. But it's not going to the broad private economy, which is where it will turn multiple times in the economy instead. Right? Well, well, and ICER told us, ICER told us that capital projects are the worst in terms of keeping money in the state. I mean, we have to buy our cement from outside, right? We right. have to buy our steel from outside. We have to buy a lot of the equipment that go, a lot of the materials that go into construction contracts. So ICER said the multiples out of, out of, out of investing, out of spending money in construction produce less income to Alaska than certain than, than the PFDs, which produce the most income to Alaska. And, and they produce less income even than the, than the operating budget. So, Yes, I, there there is some benefit to Alaska from construction contracts, but it's less than if you use the same amount of money that you're spending on these on infrastructure. Right, it's less than if you spent that money, uh, let that money go out through the PFD and let Alaska families make the choices about where that money goes. Well. Um... I mean, we could keep touting, tooting this horn. I don't know if anybody's listening at this point, um, but I mean, we got to keep tooting this horn. We 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 need to become more self reliant and more dependent on our own 
private economy than on the government because we're seeing what's happening. We're, we're seeing what's happening, the, the dependency on federal dollars, the dependency on state dollars. When the eventual bill comes due, and it will eventually come due because that's simple arithmetic, we are going to be hurting if we don't become more self-reliant in those regards. Yeah, and you can't you can't tell it by looking at the R or the D behind behind the name. I mean, yeah. Cook Bishop is one of those who pushes spending over and over and over. Steve Thompson's been one of those who's pushed infrastructure spending at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska well, even over and over and over. Yeah, even so you we, have to you have to dig into the candidate. We, even Will Stapp, the new uh, new candidate, Will Stapp, a nice guy, had him on the program, but even he is touting that same line, and that is worrying to me in light of everything that we're seeing right now. We've got to we've got to learn to live within our means. We've got to learn to keep that money in the private economy in the biggest way and get out of the way of private industry and let government be the smallest portion, the smallest function in the state. It's or, or or if you're going to have that, at least raise it equitably from all Alaska families. Don't shove it down just to Middle and lower income Alaska. Well, that was the first thing he said. He's against taxes of any form. He's not. He's not interested in any taxes, and he's okay with the leftover PFD. So yeah. Well, it, so so what he's saying is, I, I don't want taxes on the upper twenty percent. I want taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families. That's my right. idea of of where taxes ought to be. Uh, that's just. I mean, that's 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 Click Bishop. That's yeah. that's Steve Thompson. That's not that's not getting us closer to where we need to be. Exactly. That's just that's just embedding us further in uh, in where we've been brad keithley alaska's for sustainable budgets thank you my friends good to hear from you michael as always thanks for having me we will see you next week my friend with the governor's budget in hand we'll see where we're at well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us remember that you can find past episodes on our youtube soundcloud spotify and substack pages And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.